Hello and welcome back. Sean here, Mountains Garage in the beautiful state of Maine. Today I'm going to build the drive, we're going to build the drive shaft for my 64 Dodge Dart GT Turbo LS Power Glide 9 inch Ford Swap. The 64 Dart is not a small car. It's longer than a Nova for sure. This drive shaft is going to be seven inches longer than my gray Nova. Crazy. I build my own shafts because I've had a few experiences. Got a schooling when I bought the SFI rated shaft for my orange car from Jerry Bickle, one of the premier chassis manufacturers. That if he TIG welded up a chrome molly shaft, he didn't have a lot of balance issues and he didn't need the yokes and U joints because they're serviceable. Locally, I would get hassled if I didn't give him that stuff or told. I'd be told that if it vibrated, it was my problem. So I might as well build it myself. Knock on wood, I've yet to have one vibrate. I don't need wood, yeah, right here we go. Anyway, my process, relatively simple. I buy the pots. I've chosen a three inch shaft today because that's what I have for pots. Stuff is hard to come by right now, believe it or not. This is a chrome molly tube. A friend of mine, Wants me to build him a drive shaft. He's ordered a tube. It's been a month and a half and he hasn't got it yet from Strange. This tube I had, along with the Spicer yokes. Buyer beware, believe it or not, the offshore stuff uses the same pot number as the Spicer. So, unless you are absolutely certain, like you get the box, you never know what you're gonna get if you just order the pot number. It might show up and not be the right stuff. I've used the offshore stuff, it's okay. It's not quite as nice as a Spicer. Slightly larger OD by a thousandth and a half, which seems like a quarter of an inch when you're trying to get it into the tube because it's a tight fit. Ultimately, it, I would have some giant press arrangement, but I don't. I have very simple tools I'm gonna use today. My process is to get the tube unpackaged and hope that one end is usable as is. In this case, I'm not gonna be able to have a lot of waste because I'm going to use most of the shaft to build a shaft that's 59 and a half inches long. Tube's only 60, minus two inches for the end, so I'll probably cut off four inches or so. I was fortunate one end is definitely usable. I've cleaned it up. I've kind of test fitted and it feels like this is going to go without too much hassle. I clean the inside of the tube like a gun barrel. I'll, you can put some cleaner in it and shove it down through with a pipe or a broomstick or something, because I want to get the debris out of it, because that's been cut, I don't know how many times, there's a lot of debris inside it. I don't want to introduce any problems. And I will, I'm sitting on a, this is a rubber mat that I stand on. I'll stand the dry shaft tube on the rubber mat. I'll stand on the bench with my hammer, and I'll drive the one yoke end in first. And then I'm gonna carefully measure. I gotta jack the car up and just triple check my measurements. And I will use what I consider the only accurate way to cut a drive shaft this is my rigid tubing cutter. If I'm cutting a mild steel tube, I can cut it all day. You know, I put lube on it and I'm careful, but it does not hurt the cutter. This chrome molly shaft is hard. Very difficult to cut. I'm hoping I get one nice cut without ruining my cutter. So the wheel's replaceable, but that gets expensive. So that's my method and that's what I'm going to do. One more warning, the 1350 U-joint, which is my choice of size for any drive shaft in any brand. If I'm building a shaft, it's gonna be a 1350, unless other circumstances that don't come to me at the moment come up. You know, I might build a 1310 or a 1330, but if I'm building from scratch, I'm gonna go 1350. It'll take me faster and quicker than I'm going to go at this point in time, so. If the U-joint comes in a red and white box, it's made in America. If it comes in a blue and white box, it's Chinese. Same pot number, 5-178X. Buyer beware once again. That process went really easy when you had the genuine Spicer ends and a nice quality. Give you the whole look at the tube. That's a mil spec, condition N, 4130, seamless. 2.837 ID. So now I have a perfectly machined square edge against my perfectly square shaft. 
you can see why it's really important to accurately cut the end. If I had cut this on a chop saw and it was crooked, it's just going to promote things being crooked. When I drove this in, the, the sound changes when it's hitting all the way around. I trust that to be square. I measured 59 and a half on center with the rear end hanging down in the dark. Now at ride height, 59 and three quarter seems like the perfect number. So the rear end moves backwards a quarter of an inch at right height. I take the tape measure on the cut end on that end. 59 and three quarter minus four inches because you lose two inches here on each end. So 55 and three quarter is gonna be the cut. I never put a drive shaft in a vise. I just got a clamp to the bench. Lots of lube and round and round and round. And I was nice and careful, took my time, rewarded with a flawless cut. Now I'll just deburr it, shine up the end for welding, and then I'll show you how I line her up. And the alignment answer is not high tech at all. Even without this, you can tell how this sits on the bench on both ends. And when it's right, it's right. I flip it over to check both sides, but that is as in phase as I could possibly get. But just to double check, I'll zero it here. If it reads zero on the other end, that's good enough for me. Now I will tack it four places, both ends, and then I'll go ahead and weld it up. The only concern welding it, I'm going to TIG weld it, of course, because it's chrome molly, is the last bit of weld on the last end. This is a pretty big tube, so I doubt I'll build any pressure, but it's possible, like roll cages and stuff, to build pressure. In a roll cage, you drill a hole inside the tubing where it meets the next piece of tubing. In this case, I usually get within a quarter of an inch and let things, you know, cool off a little bit and then just go for that last bit. Again, in reality, this is probably big enough it wouldn't bother, but be aware that if your weld blows out at the last second, that's why pressure on the inside. This was my welding arrangement, sitting on a small V-block. It allows me to fight this gorilla of a clamp and cable I have. It's definitely the bully in the room. But I just welded eighth inch sections I did each quarter. I had to stop and reposition. Came out pretty nice. I'll let this cool. Now we can work on the U-joints. For longer than forever, I was always lousing up my tungsten. I wasn't touching it in the puddle, but it would only last maybe an inch and a half or two inches and I have to re-grind it. The cause is me being too thrifty with the gas once again. Turn up your post flow. I just did the whole job and the tungsten still looks like new. They say one second for 10 amps. So I was running 140. I did not use 14 seconds, but I probably had a good six or seven. Dramatic improvement. Same with the weld colors. When it comes to installing U-joints, you have to think of it as not putting the U-joint in the yoke, but putting the yoke over the U-joint. I'm going to hold this all the way up through, set the cap on it fully, and tap or press it if you want to. I don't use a vise, but you can use an Ava press. Press it down way beyond the snap ring. I want this to be sticking out the other side enough that I can install the other cap and not miss. And this is what I mean. I'm way beyond the snap ring groove. When I flip it over and pull it up a little bit, there's just no way to miss with the cap when I press it back together. That way you don't lose any needle bearings. So now I've got this side flush, this side still way in. I'll go ahead and put the snap ring in and then set this in the jaws of the vise and gently tap here, or I can continue pressing down to get both snap rings in 
And then there's one final step. The final step is you need to set the snap ring, lock it in by tapping right here. Put the U-joint carefully in the vise and just tap right here. And you'll see the center of the snap ring start to rise. Not, don't go crazy, but that locks it in and frees up the U-joint. Otherwise, you've got one side pressed tight and the other side has probably started to move the snap ring, but you have to equalize it. Makes a big difference. And I also put the grease fitting this direction and in theory, rotations that way. So they claim that's the place to put it. All assembled, just ready for paint now. Probably after I measure for pinion angle, so I don't scratch it up. One drive shaft complete. Uh, putting a Plymouth tube in a Dodge. Plymouth Tube Company, it says. So that was it. Thanks for watching. Total cost uh, the weld yokes, I believe, were 20, let's call it 25 bucks a piece. And the 4130 3-inch tube was $125 on JEGS. I haven't priced it lately. So, so what's that? $175, a couple of U-joints and a yoke. So you're going to spend $225 to build yourself a drive shaft. Again, it's chrome molly, TIG welded, something you're not going to get downtown. You can go to the chassis shops and get a better product, I'm sure. Of course, I've covered this before. Steel is the most dangerous shaft there is. It will come up inside the car and take your arm off. You have to contain it multiple times. Too many old tube chassis cars. I had one where there'd be a loop in the front, a loop in the back, and nothing but aluminum over the shaft. Those are the ones that'll grab you. Even the stock floor cars, the drive shafts will come through. The next safest is aluminum. It'll shatter. Still get lots of shrapnel in pieces. And finally, the carbon fiber, the shaft itself, will disintegrate, but the steel pieces will still come through everything. If you look at Ryan Martin's car, if you follow him on Street Outlaws, his went through the rocker panel, through the roof. They found wounds all over the car. Fortunately, I think it hit him in the cheek a little bit, but it didn't hurt him any. So <sighs> that's that. Uh, a lot of cars you look in with the exposed transmissions and you're still looking at the yoke. A lot of people are reinforcing the Pro Mod or Pro Top Sportsman rules say so you have to cover the front 12 inch, the back 6 inch, and then still have loops in the middle. The more you contain this area, the better off you are. So even the old dot's going to get a couple drive shaft loops. Thanks for watching. Who knows what we'll do next? Probably pinion angle and weld in the rear end, but who knows? Have a great weekend.